In Parker versus the District of Columbia, you wrote the 2007 opinion striking down parts of the District of Columbia's ban on handguns as unconstitutional. In the Heller decision last year, 2008, the Supreme Court upheld you. Let me quote you. You remarked recently, when the case first came to me, I had been under the impression that the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms, was a collective right. When I looked into it, I concluded to the contrary. Now explain for this layman what a collective right is, and then tell me what changed your thinking. Well, the theory had been for much of the 20th century in federal courts, and a theory that had uh, attracted the views of Warren Berger, who gave a speech on it, that the Second Amendment's prefatory clause, which, as you know, relates to the uh, uh, a well-ordered uh, militia right. is necessary. A, well, yeah. a well-regulated militia, militia being necessary to the security of a free state, comma, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. The notion was that that prefatory clause modified the right to keep and bear arms. That is to say, the prefatory clause indicated to some people and to uh, a number of courts that there was no individual right, the right was only to act in a militia. Right. Uh, and it's only because I had never looked at the issue uh, in any uh, legal proceeding that I had this background view that it came from a speech Warren Berger had given some years ago that it was a collective right. Uh, when I re started reading the briefs in the case uh, and looking at the, carefully looking at the language of the Second Amendment, I concluded otherwise. How come? What do you do with that? It seems to me I'm a layman. There's the plain language of the Constitution. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, comma, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So it's pretty clear that at one very reasonable argument is you get to carry a gun only to the extent that, that securing the defense of the District of Columbia is necessary, and nobody's worried about the defense of the District of Columbia. That can be handled by people other than individuals. Therefore, you don't actually have a right to bear arms. Well, that was the argument. But the, so uh, what's wrong with the argument? Well, you're, you're asking me to go review my opinion. Which but, is 70 uh, pages long. Yeah, so, yes, <laughs> That's a dirty trick. It is. Uh, but the, uh, the essential point is that the framers of the Constitution were skilled lawyers. Uh, the prefatory clause describes the federal purpose, but the operative language, the right to keep and bear arms, uh, was perceived by the framers, and the way it is drafted, it is clear that this is true, as a pre-existing right. It wasn't a right granted by the Constitution. It was a right that was protected by the Constitution. And it didn't say we create a right. It said the right shall be, as you Shall not be infringed. Shall not be infringed, which implies that it pre-existed. Now, the reason why there's a prefatory clause is simply to suggest what the federal purpose in maintaining the right to, of individuals to, to bear arms. The federal purpose was so that they could be used in the event of a militia call. And indeed, the first Congress and the second Congress uh, define militia to include all able-bodied men uh, within between the ages, I think, of 18 and 40. So you were, and you were obliged to own a rifle or a shotgun or a pistol uh, and a sword so that you would be prepared to come to the defense of the country or the state as a, a militiaman. Judge Silberman, do you mean to tell me that you address this critical issue in the District of Columbia in the 21st century, entirely with reference to 18th century thinking, custom, practice, why you originalist you. Yes, of course that's true. Uh, I plead guilty. I, like uh, your prior interviewee, Nino Scalia, have the view that the uh, Constitution must be read as any body of law, whether it's a statute or a contract or whatever, as it was written, with its original meaning. That's not the word original intent. That's, that's a misleading phrase, but it's original meaning. And therefore, when you look at what the Second Amendment means today, you have to look at it, what it was meant, what, what was meant by it when it was written.